Today is May 10th, 2015. My name is Dr. Lustiger Thaler. I'm interviewing Mrs. Mimi Weingarten for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Kleiman Family Holocaust Education Center. Mrs. Weingarten, can you tell me where you were born and your date of birth? I was born in Siget, Romania at that time, occupied by Hungary. When I left it, I left Hungary. I uh, was born in 1929, February 14th. Tell me a little bit about Siget as you were growing up, some of your early memories. As far as I could remember, I think it was a very nice town, nice Jewish life. Uh, the youth was very happy. Uh, there were schools, all kinds. Uh, gymnasium and also above that, graduate schools. Um, and the Jewish schools? Not in my day. Mm -hmm. My sister had, she tells me, three elementary, she is four years older. She had three elementary classes in Yiddish school. I don't know what that meant. There was a Bisiako where I went to public school and after school we went to Bisiako. That didn't last very long. I only had about two years because our teacher was sent away. I don't know whether she was German or just spoke German, was educated in Chernovitz, which was Romania. Uh, life was good for us children. We were sheltered. My parents worked hard. Father had a small business. We were not farmers, but he made uh, dairy products. The milk were brought in from the vicinity, small towns, was collected there from the farmers and brought into the city. And we had two milk separators. He made butter, cheese, uh, cream, and also hard cheeses. Mm -hmm. Made a living. Hard work, I imagine. We children had all the little things in life, did not miss anything. Life was good. I thought it was very attractive. They called it small Paris. Paris. Mm. The youth was the schools, the older ones, upper schools, and entertainment was going to a sweet shop sit around with a cup of coffee. Uh, there were movie houses, we had a theater. Uh, they seemed happy. I was young, went to school. In 1940, we were occupied. This was Romania, we were occupied by Hungary. Things gradually changed. Uh, Before we go into the change, um, could you just tell me a little bit more about your family members? How many uh, siblings did you have? We were five children, four girls, and one boy. And their names were? And the name was from Etty, Nachman, the little boy, Raisi, me, and then my sister, who was four years older. We are the two that survived. My parents were young, full of hopes, looking forward to the children to grow up. That will make life easier. I don't know what it meant, but we're hoping to see them grow. Uh, with the occupation of Hungary, things changed immediately, not for better. Uh, our business was in, we were in the center city, Yiddish uh, Grass, it was exactly across the street from the courthouse. There was a little square, church, movie house, the courthouse, and where we lived. Uh, there was a little park built, I even called it my park, because I used to hang out there all the time children after school. I would say it was a good life. We were happy, the children, no problems. 
It was peaceful until one day a crazy person, he was called, I remember, I think it was Vasilake, a Romanian, got dressed in a uh, evening wear. Uh, Not be an evening outfit, what do you call it? A tux, 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 tuxedo. Mm -hmm. And with a high hat on a white horse with a baton in his hand and a few followers, picked up a little band of three people and came through the city to center city yelling with his baton, da, with the Jews. And we children, I must have been six years old, maybe seven, we followed him, and we also yelled, da, with the Jews. <laughs> Did we know what it means? No. And school continued for what, a What a while. memory, what a memory. It was interesting to us children, some excitement <laughs> going through the city yelling down with the Jews. Did we understand what we are saying? <laughs> Probably not. Incredible irony. irony. And this was the first incident that I remember anti-Semitic. And little by little we used to hear, you know, we children, what did we understand? Uh, we heard that Jews were thrown down from a running train Sometimes they would get badly hurt. Sometimes when the train came into the railroad station, it would slow. So they didn't get killed, but they got badly hurt from a running train. These are the little incidents that I recall anti-Semitic. Then one Friday, we heard that something is happening in the city against Jews. So they locked the doors, the school was closed up, and they didn't let us get home. We were Orthodox children. It was a tragedy. Friday night, not to be able to go home. We were told to remain. They are notified. People didn't have telephones yet in their homes. They were notified the parents that they should send for the children because there was unrest. We didn't understand what it was all about, but it was already getting dark, and to us that was a tragedy. <laughs> Friday night to remain in school, and little by little, little people had maids, Gentile people, help, and they would send them for the children. Uh, something happened on the main square, whether they beat up somebody or killed somebody, I don't even know what it was. But it was the first uh, open anti-Semitic incident in the city. Oh, that's what I remember as such. Life somehow wasn't the same. Jews started feeling insecure. We didn't know what's coming. Shortly after that, our area was occupied by Hungary. And that was a big change because people did not speak Hungarian. My parents had secular Hungarian schools. So in the house, my mother spoke to us Hungarian and my father only Yiddish. Jewish children have to know how to speak Yiddish because that's a language that's spoken all over the world. We didn't know what he meant by it, but we were told we will speak only Yiddish in the house. My father, we spoke to him, he spoke Hungarian because he had Hungarian school, would never answer only in Yiddish. So I speak fluently Yiddish because of that. And life was normal for a while. With the Hungarians, things changed already. We, my father had a business center city, very nice location. It was across the way from, across the street from the courthouse. It was a square, 
courthouse, a Greek Orthodox church, a movie building, but the entrance was on the other end of the city, actually. It was very, very large. And the building where we lived, which had an upstairs first floor uh, home and downstairs business locations. My father had his store in that. Uh, it was the entrance of this yard. We had a house in the yard. It was inherited. It was a Kahan uh, building. The original owners weren't alive anymore. They were relatives. I don't exactly know who they were to us, but we, the upstairs was occupied by the original owners, and we lived in that yard in our own house. I think it was inherited, but I'm not sure. Mm. And we went to school, and it was public school that we went to. And after school, we went to Beis Yaakov, came home at 3 or 4 o'clock, until 6 we had Hebrew school. But for me, that didn't last long. I had, I think, two years of Beis Yaakov. And then they deported the teacher. I think that she was a Polish girl, but lived in Romania in Chernowitz. That's where she was educated. It was the second state from ours that she came from, and she had to leave. So Besyakov was closed up. It was one teacher that ran different classes. And you had this teacher for two years? I was only two years when she was deported. Mm -hmm. Had to go home. Actually, what happened, the hung Hungary occupied Romania, that area. Not all Romania, just that northern part, it, once, once, it was once Austro-Hungary. So this is how my parents had Hungarian school. They had secular Hungarian schools. So they spoke Hungarian. My mother would speak, my mother tongue was actually Yiddish. My father insisted Jewish children have, did I say that already? I think I did. And uh, this is how I speak fluently Yiddish. But in the house was spoken Hungarian. So to us, the change wasn't a tragedy. Mm. So we spoke the language, so it was easy with the change of the schools. Life was good. We children had everything. Parents worked hard until the Hungarians started in politically, uh, we knew that we were being occupied by Germany eventually. The German army passed over through the city to Russia. They were going to, they, the battle front was in Russia, but we didn't feel anything. Life was still normal, except that the windows had to be covered with dark sheets of paper that they shouldn't see lights, that it's a city and not a town. They were afraid of bombardment, probably. And it continued like that until 19, I think, 41 or 42. I don't exactly know. And that's when the Hungarians occupied that area where we lived. So it became Hungary. Life was normal for a short while only. And then they started that any Gentile that wants a Jewish business could get it. So we were among the first. We were in Center City. It was called the Yiddish Gas. And uh, it was a nice location, so naturally we were among the first that they closed up. My father made dairy products. The milks were brought in. Did I say that? I think I did. So life changed for us especially. <laughs> so 
companies, the businesses closed up. Do you no remember? One. Do you remember uh, that process? Your father's reactions and it was very sad. Um, I don't know their economics, need a living. I don't know what they had or didn't have, but we children had everything. We, we were told always how hard it is, but it was a nice life. There was a Jewish community, a Yiddish Gemeinde, and then they had a Kultur Gemeinde. Uh, it was very interesting. People paid taxes to belong. And you had to belong because you couldn't live or die if you didn't belong to the Yiddish Gemeinde. You didn't exist or tough in the Jewish community. And the Jews were everything in the city. The population of the city was 45,000 and 15,000 Jews. Uh, they were living center city mostly had little businesses, and those that had a little business could exist, make a living. Europe was poor, and Jews were very poor in most of these cities. If somebody had a little business, it was okay. If you didn't have that, it was struggle. I remember uh, rich business people, where the woman would have in the kitchen large pots, cook lunch for people, and people stood online for a meal. And they themselves, because it was a mitzvah, so they cooked themselves. Uh, came lunchtime, people lined up for a bowl of something, food. She would take their meal and feed them. Uh, people tried to help those that were in need. I think these were mostly out of town towners that came in for a day work. So they prepared a lunch for them. Uh, we had all the little things in life. Our parents worked hard. And my mother would always let us know, don't think that life is what you have at home, meaning that there is hardships. Uh, you were saying before that um, your father's business was taken over. It, well, it was closed up immediately. And then came what we called a Zipzer, a German that lived in, actually the family came long ago to this part of Romania to settle. This was a son, a drunkard with a wife and children and couldn't make a go of life because he was always drunk. And he came and told my father, Kahan, I am opening up your business. I'm closing up your business and I'll open it. So my father said, and what will you do? Because it was the kind of line you had to know it to be able to exist. He said, I don't know, I'll sell something. He thought you just take money. If you have an open door, people come and give you money. He didn't even understand that he has to have something to sell. Uh, but business was immediately taken from my father. Uh, naturally, it was a bad feeling. I don't know what they had or didn't, but five children in the house and no income. And this, the business was closed. Then my father had an idea that he would make with him a quiet partnership that meant it wasn't legal, it was illegal because a Gentile was not supposed to have a business with a Jew. Little by little, we started feeling that. Uh, that anybody wants anything from Jews, all they have to do is apply and they were getting it. They would just close it up and give it to them. So it was hardships, but we existed. And as a young girl, I must have been 11 or 12, we still had at home a servant and a uh, man that was helping around the house. and. 
actually uh, they were not allowed to work anymore for Jews, so my parents had to let them go. They would put me on a railroad train to the town from where the milk was brought into the city, and I would bring like 10 kilos, butter, cheeses, whatever the farmer could make himself, just for the family. They would put me on a train in the morning and hide it under the seats. And in the evening, somebody would come to take me off. I couldn't carry it. And so we had what to eat for the family. Uh, gradually, things changed. Uh, the Hungarians came out with new laws against Jews. And we started feeling anti-Semitism. It wasn't yet entirely official, but Quietly, they did what they wanted to. We had an incident where they went to the police and they told them, go to Kahan, this German guy who closed up our business, went to police, go to Kahan, he has 10 kilos gold. Who had 10 kilo gold? <laughs> Small merchant, you know. So they came to our house, they tore up the floors, those wooden floors. They opened up the ceilings, they tore apart the, uh, what did they call it, the upstairs, everything they could. And naturally, did they find gold to have such thing? And we remained with the problems. Uh, such things they did in many instances to many people. And then we started hearing that Jewish children were not be allowed to the public schools. Jewish schools were closed up. My little brother who went to Heder, that was closed up. And uh, we heard rumors that children were not be allowed to public schools. Uh, time came, and sure enough, we were not allowed to schools. But my father was a war veteran and a war orphan. His father was in the First World War, came back and died. And uh, because of that, they came out with a law that was called numerous clauses. My sister, who was already here, she was four years older in gymnasium, she was thrown out. But the younger children, if we wanted to, we could go to a school on the outskirts of the city, close to the mountains, where the uh, peasant children, there was a school for peasants. They came down to that school. It was inferior to all others, but 6% of Jewish children were allowed to come to school, whose father was a veteran or something that they did exceptional for the country. And naturally, we hated that. It was far from home. We didn't have buses. We didn't have the kind of clothes that children have today. And it was hard. And uh, I used to come home and beg my father, why do I have to go? The Gentile children were very mean to us. We weren't welcomed. First of all, we were better students than them. They didn't like that. And the teachers were impossible. They were people that came back already from the battle's front, front injured. And actually, you made the war. <laughs> we Jewish children made the war. So it was very bad. I used to come home and say to my father, why do I have to go there? They're going to make us right on. We went to school six days. Why do I have to go? They'll make us right on Shabbat. Um, we were not Hasidim, but strictly Orthodox, naturally, and snuck them. And school was very important to my parents. They insisted we have to go. So we had no choice, and we went until that ended, too. 
life was uh, bearable because the family was together very close. We lived close to each other. My grandparents were very comfortable, beautiful home, so we would always see each other. And there was warmth and love, and it was bearable. Until they started coming out with restrictions. Jews were not allowed only certain hours to go out from their homes. Uh, now they did not have any businesses anymore, everything was taken away. Uh, some were reopened and others just did not have any, anything. My father made a quiet partnership with this Gentile fellow that closed it up. He was a German descendant, but uh, he didn't know anything about Germany or so, but he had a right because he was German. <laughs> and my father went and made with him a quiet partnership. And, and what will we sell there? He had a cousin with a very successful bakery in the city, so he was closed up. So he went to him and said, you know what, let's reopen this business, your bakery and you'll give me uh, merchandise, bread and so on, and we'll sell it in my location. At that time we already heard that everything will be rationed, but it wasn't yet. And this partnership existed for a while until oh, bread was given on little tickets for you had every family had a sheet of tickets for a certain length of time and actually you started making false tickets and my father wasn't in the business anymore my sister who was thrown out of school was there and the gentile guy and they didn't know the difference between good tickets and bad tickets, and they took everything until one day they caught the person that was manufacturing the tickets. And that was already terrible because uh, they came and they arrested my father, even though he wasn't too much there. But my sister was very small. Uh, they started beating. They would take them in and beat them up that they should tell who was involved in this business. As my father insisted he had nothing to do with it, it was my sister's business. He just would come in sometimes to help out. And uh, they took him in for an interrogation. Naturally, they beat them badly. And my sister went to the no, it wasn't the courthouse, I think it was the police, and told them my father had nothing to do with it, that she is the one, that it was in the business, and he doesn't know anything about it, he's not at fault, and they let him out, and they took her in, she was arrested. She was at that time 18 years old, maybe less, I don't even know. and. Uh, she was put to jail. And there, for money, you could do many things. She was sent away by, we were Hungarians now, he was sent, she was sent away to a big jail in Budapest. And then my mother went up with money. And for money, you could do many things in those countries. There was a lot of uh, theft, theft, and Production. Corruption, that's it. And uh, she paid off somebody, and so she was kept mildly uh, locked up. She would be sort of free, but had to report back to the jail in the evening. And then eventually, for money, it was settled, and they let her out. How long did this process take? This took a year. And it was very tragic for my parents, a girl in those years, to be jailed, it was a tragedy. But we were still home. Life was going on. 
And gradually things had gotten worse. She took her out, you know, for money. Like I said before, money was good all over. And uh, she was deported then with the family to, we were deported to Auschwitz uh, about a year later, 1944. Yeah, 44. Uh, it was hard. These were the things that happened before deportation. And it was very sad, naturally. Uh, we didn't know what was coming. Uh, we were locked into our homes. We would only be allowed out certain hours. This was not ghetto yet. Still, everybody was in their homes, but they had no income. Uh, bread was rationed, and I think milk was rationed. There were hardships, because with children, food was scarce. We were very, very lucky. My father had many Gentile friends from the army, and they would come around to see that they, we need something, and they would, would bring in lots of, they were mostly small farmers. They would bring in food, like corn, fruits, and vegetables that they grew. So we were not too much in trouble. We could exist, but most people really had it very, very hard. Couldn't buy anything that just wasn't, it wasn't available. Uh, until 1944, and then we heard that they're gonna take us away from home to labor camps. But we didn't, I don't know whether anybody knew what's coming. You know, uh, transportation wasn't what it is today. No cars, not, not too many trains a day were running. We were on top of the Carpathians, which is mountains, not easily accessible. And we didn't know much. We really, there were a few telephones in the city but only mostly businesses had them, and there were some that were open for business where you could communicate with other cities. And it wasn't the world that is it now. It was hardships. And then things from day to day, they came out with new decrees. They made it harder and harder. Then we heard that they're gonna take us away from home to labor camps. We didn't know what it meant. We couldn't even understand it, especially us children. had no idea what this means. But we were locked in to our own homes, allowed only an hour or two certain hours during the day, not at all at night. And then they started with the yellow star that they should know who are Jews. Uh, they were recognized as Bull because they wore a yellow star. And then we heard that they'll take us away. That was very frightening. But we hoped that if it's for labor, we'll survive. Nobody knew that. They have concentration camps and such stuff. Maybe there were probably the leadership of the city maybe had an idea what's going on in the world. But generally the public, I don't think that they knew what's coming. And it was very hard. Because the fact that there was no food, children were hungry, it was unbearable, really. It was not easy. But there was the family, and the family still, like I said, like to us, the Gentile friends came and brought in some stuff, so we didn't really starve. We just didn't have everything like before, but we could exist. And my grandparents were also I always said I had a liberated grandmother's 
and liberated mothers, our parents always worked. So we had a lot of Gentile acquaintance, and there were some nice people that tried to help. Not too many, but we still had in the house what was important. And life went on until we heard that they're going to take us away from the city. It was hardships. I don't remember good times really because I was young and then suddenly the world turned. But we were used to it was war time and we knew this is what it is. And we waited to see what will come. And only worse things came. And one day we heard that they're gonna take us away to labor. We didn't know what that meant, didn't even understand it. And uh, little by little, new, new laws and things got stricter and harder with everything until they collected us. One day they said they're going to take us to labor. The ghettos, actually we went later to ghettos than everybody else. Our house doctor was very close friend with my parents. And the doctor said, Kahan, we lived in the same yard. We had a house there, so did he. Uh, you're not going anywhere. I'm not staying here alone. So my father said, what do you mean I'm not going? He said, well, we'll see what we can do. I don't want to be alone in the city. <laughs> he wouldn't have been alone because there were still many people, but in our yard, everybody was taken to a ghetto, which was the other end of the city. And my parents were planning to go to an uncle that had in the outskirts a large home. This is where we were planning to be in the ghetto. So he came one day and he said, now listen, uh, they're taking out already the last ones, the lawyers, the doctors, this and that, but he was still remaining. He said, I'll put a red uh, note on your door that a child has scarlet fever. In those years, since medication wasn't what it is today, and that was very contagious, I promise you nobody will come near to the house. And so it was. He put out a red note on the door that there's a child with scarlet fever. Germans didn't even come close to it. Actually, it was mostly the Hungarian police, but once in a while they would have a longer German to scare us more, you know. Nobody came near the house. We remained three more weeks. The ghetto started liquidating. They collected the people in the main shul, which was a large building, and they started taking them to railroad, to the railroads. We were still home. Then after the three weeks, the note was taken off. And the doctor came with us. We were the last uh, transport from the city. It was the lawyers, the doctors, and uh, some government Jews that had government positions. And they took us to Auschwitz. We were separated from everybody we knew. My father in the wagon, it took about three days, the train, well, we didn't know how long it would take, but it took about three days. My father, who was religious, got up in the morning and put on fuel and, oh, one of his brothers ran away from forced labor, so he came with us on the train. He didn't want to remain there alone in that city among the Gentiles. He couldn't have existed. They probably would have killed him. So he came along. So in the morning they got up to Daven. They put on Trillin. So these people, the lawyers, the doctors who weren't observant, were yelling from the other end of the car, stupid Jew, don't you know where you're going? You're going to your death. What are you praying for? And it was very sad. We children and we heard that. We didn't know what to make of it, naturally. 
It was very, very sad, and this was the trip toward Auschwitz. With the entire family together? Yeah. At this point still? My grandparents had left before, because they were in the ghetto before us. We were among the last ones. So we were mostly with the outskirts of the city, professional people, people that worked for the government. The last ones that they pulled out, the Judenrat, which were the advisors of the city for the then government, and so on. And we were heading over to Auschwitz. Took three days without food, without toilet, without a drink, without anything, but we survived got off the train, and there were Polish uh, people that were interned already for years. And they were the ones that got us out of the trains. Rush, 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 left, right, left, right, and there was a center lane. And I saw my older sister when we were taking off. It just right there, running toward where the man was. She was running to say goodbye to father, wanted to hear what father thinks of this. And he said, remember who you are, wherever you will be, don't forget who you are from home. And then she ran to my mother. In the same way, she had my little sister at her hand. My father had my little brother who I don't even know how old he was. I think he must have been 10 years old, maybe 9, 10, I don't know. And uh, then she went to my mother, and my mother had run to her, to my youngest little sister. And she said the same words to her. And that was my little friend, the doctor's daughter. And I said, Evika, please come with us. I pulled her. Her mother wouldn't let her go. No, I want her with me. And then we started, we were thrown into a, the center lane. Didn't know what it was. There was a body on the wires. The wires were electric, uh, electric, uh, they were on electric wires. And as she ran over the wires, she was immediately burned. And when I saw that from there on, I didn't know what's going on. I was so confused to see that dead body that I just was going along, and it was with the youth. They put us in the group that were taking, they were taking to work. And somehow I lost myself. I was just going with the crowd, and we ended up in beautiful, clean halls. With the tile floors, immaculate, big, and there was a row of toilets. Uh, we call them uh, not American uh, English toilets. They were luxurious looking, very clean with clean water. And I remember wanting to go there take a little water to drink. It looked clean water. And it must have been an SS woman. You stupid. Don't you see those are toilets? Didn't let, I didn't even get near it, maybe like three feet from that place where they had that water. But I was so thirsty that I, I didn't care what it is. It looked like water and I was going to drink it. You stupid, don't you see that those are toilets? Did not, didn't let us even near it. And then from room to room, they undressed us, shaved our hair, and there we were in Auschwitz. We, I was looking, I had a younger sister with us at that time, my older sister. We didn't like, I was looking for them couldn't find them, didn't recognize them. There was thousands of people, naturally. I mean, in the rooms, probably just hundreds. And we didn't recognize each other at all. Once we were shaven, 
and not only that they were lost, not eaten, not you know, thirsty and so on. We did not find each other. We just went down. We were left, right, left, right. We didn't know what that was already Mangala there doing his selection. And uh, they showered us and they gave us dresses. So some were long, some were too short, some were too tight, some were too loose. And we couldn't find each other in the crowd. We were together. There was the crematorium. This is the beginning of Auschwitz. Very, very sad times. And once we were taken on the ground of where there were barracks, we were lined up in rows of five. But I don't even remember clearly what it was because I was so confused. We were all so confused. We didn't know what's happening, you know, a situation like that. It was very, very frightening. We were told that they killed people. We did not believe it. Can you believe such a thing, that they're going to kill us? Why? And he came into the grounds of the barracks. They lined us up. And they told us there will be selection, no food, no water. I don't know how long a time at all, because we lost you know, uh, knowledge. We weren't clear anymore, you know? confused. That's, that's the word. We were confused. We didn't know what was going on. And then hours later, they, you know, we weren't people that uh, were disciplined. We didn't understand why stand down line, what does it all mean? It took them a long time. Once we were lined up, they told us we'll get food. We never got the food, I don't remember, I don't know. Uh, we were confused, we, we didn't need food, we just didn't understand what was happening. And then we were introduced to the barracks. We were told that's where you're gonna live. There was a thousand people to each barrack, 30 barracks in an area. So it was thousands of people just going around dazed uh, until we found each other because we didn't recognize each other. Probably confusion and hunger and all that had happened. And. Uh, and they got us lined up. They told us that they're going to count us. Finally, we were lined up in rows of five. And they're going to count us. This was already selection. Even Mangala came, a very handsome person. I don't know whether I knew at that time, but he must have been about 50 years old, maybe 40 only. Uh, that's what I thought. Very handsome, beautifully dressed, immaculate, with white gloves. Left, right, left, right. And did they give us to eat? I don't know. But once they gave us a bowl, and the bowl was, a f you could get as much as you wanted, it was Bali. Uh, the way it's it comes from when it's picked up on the ground with dirt, with whatever there was that was cooked, that was soft. Uh, I couldn't eat it. My sister, once I found my sister, we were together, three of us. And she said to me, she was older, Mammy, hold your nose, close your eyes, and swallow. I couldn't swallow that stuff. No way. For a year, I stopped in camp. I was 15, then I came out, I looked like seven years old. I ate the bread, which was a little square of some kind of mixture of grains, heavy, very heavy, about an inch thick. I would say four by four, a little square, that I ate. 
in the morning and black coffee. And sometimes I would save it for the evening. And on that I lived for the whole year. Then came the problem. We were in barracks. Uh, there was no such thing as cleaning or shower. Oh, there was a washroom. They called it a washroom, which had faucets somehow. They were high up. People washed under it. My sister had an idea. We were very afraid. Uh, in a few days, people started itching lice. They had lice. That they came with them already from the ghettos and so on. So my sister went out during the night to the washroom, and that was not allowed. The barracks were closed. They had doors front and back, and they had like three, four people watching the door that nobody should exit. Uh, she, the doors were, these people were day and night there. We were not allowed to go to the washroom. There were barrels prepared, uh, large dishes for to go instead of the toilet. And she had an idea. She couldn't go on those barrels because they were smelly, it was terrible. She ran out somehow. She said to me, I'm going to the door. I asked her to, these were Jewish girls from among us that had these positions of watching the doors. That was a position. Uh, I'll ask her to do me a favor and let me out. I cannot go there. And if she doesn't let me out, I'll beat her up. I'll kill her and I'll go out. And she went to the door. She managed to get out and came back. When she came back, she said, you know, there are clusters of chlor as it's taken out of the ground, you know. Uh, they were blocks, large blocks piled, and they're hard. But I could manage to scrape out some areas were a little softer, and I would put that on my body. She put that on her body and washed herself. She came back. It's wonderful because that's going to keep us clean. We will not get lice. And the following night, she took me out with my little sister. She said, now listen, I'm going to the door. If the girls will not let me out, there were brooms with what they kept the place clean. I'm going to beat her up. Even if I kill her, I don't care. But I'll get you and you children run, run to the washroom. That was very dangerous because naturally they had access during the night also with weapons on the grounds. But this is the only way we could be clean. Otherwise, we would die from the lice, she felt. And uh, we did that a few times a week, and it kept us clean. It helped. I was starved because I did eat. She ate, and my little sister ate, and they were good. I was very weak. Now you stop one day, two days, but I was getting just very weak. But we were alive. I also had an incident where one day a leg started to swell. Why? I don't know. The whole leg from the bottom up, every day a little more, until it got to a point it was really blown up. The doctor of the so-called hospital, the Revere, they called it the Revere, was a lady from our city. She was my mother's uh, gynecologist, obstetrician. And she knew us. We lived near her parents. She was away in school. And uh, my sister went to her and told her that my leg is swollen and I cannot stand anymore the Tselapel. Tselapel was they took us out at 3 in the morning and would let us stand five in a row for many hours from 3 until it got light, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. And then Wengele came and selected. 
and he just went with his finger. This one goes out, that one goes, that one goes out. So my sister told her that I can't stand. What should she do? You keep her there or else she'll go to the crematorium, just like that. And she said, if she gets very, very bad, call me, come and tell me what's going on. And it was getting worse every day. I didn't have food, I didn't eat, and I didn't drink. And I was getting weaker and weaker, and that leg was getting swollen, and it was getting blue and spots first. And then, all the way from top to bottom, navy blue. And I couldn't stand anymore. I felt faint. People held me up. They were very nice. And many, they would tell me, many please, we'll pick you up when Mangala comes and uh, punch. Uh, pinch. Pinch. What? Pinch your chin. Pinch your uh, face that it should get red. But please stand up when he comes. They held me. And then they let go when he came, and I couldn't stand anymore. So I said to my sister, I don't care. Let them take me. I can't take it. So she went to the doctor who knew us. And the doctor said, all right, so bring her into the revier. That was dangerous, because from there they took everybody constantly. She put me in with the light sick, those that weren't too sick, cold or such. There was such a thing, too. Or um, somebody would have an injury where they would let them lay in the barracks. And I came there, and I found that three girls my age, they were 15. And one said, the name is so-and-so. I said, where are you from? And she told me, oh my god, I know who you are. You're my friend. I was your friend's best friend. She was from a town near the city. The family, her uh, family, a cousin, we were just next door neighbors, actually. The buildings were touching back where we lived, and they had a business next to my father's business. And I discovered her at somebody I know. And uh, the second girl was very sick. She was also from near her town. And she said to me, Mimi, I'm very sick. If I die, I leave you my bread. She couldn't eat, so she saved the bread. And she knew I am not eating. So you take my accumulation of bread. And uh, the doctor came. And she said to me like this, now listen, I'll let you rest here. Hopefully you'll get better. I don't know. But I promise you, as soon as I'll have medication, I'll bring you. But she didn't have medication. She would come to say hello. And she said, listen, I have here a friend, a doctor. I'm going to send you milk every day. So she sent me in a glass, tinchy bit of milk. Every day, this doctor came and brought me the milk. And remember, cover up. And if they tell you it's selection, Angela comes, cover up to the neck, and smile, and pinch your face that it should be red. And this is what I did. And I was there two weeks. One day she comes in, oh, I see a yellow spot. Your leg is getting better. It was navy blue. She says, oh, this is improvement. So I was hopeful, and I lay there two more weeks, and it cleared just by itself. And my friend near me died, the one that promised me the bread. And I opened my eyes, and the first thing I look under her head, where she laid, where the, the bread is, and the bread was gone. I was very, very sad. I was very sad because I was hoping I'll have what to eat. And I came out from the Revy and back in Auschwitz. I was in the Zee Lager, Birkenau, and there we did nothing. They just kept us. Actually, originally, I, we were in Block 13. And one day, 
I was getting thinner and thinner, not eating. They selected me out and they took us to the front of the camp, a group of people. My sister came running. She said, Mimi, nobody's here. Run from here back. Wherever you're going, just go in some place to a barrack. Meaning, where was that to go? But naturally, this wasn't that simple because if somebody ran away, a person was missing. And they searched the camp. There were 30,000 people. Could they find me? No. And I survived. And then she realized, you know what? You children are too young. You will never get out of here. You can't be here, my sister. So what do we do? She said, I found a woman, and she says she's our relative. We were Romanians. They were in Czechoslovakia. I didn't know them at all. Uh, they were once in our house, my sister said, but I had no recollection of that. But she says she's a cousin. They weren't cousins. They were some distant cousins, mothers, uh, cousins, children. And she was a, she had a position as a group supervisor, a uh, barrack supervisor. And sh she had the children's block. So my sister wanted very much to go into that block. Maybe there will have a better chance. Among adults, we were halflings, little and thin. Maybe in the children's block, we have a better chance of surviving. So she arranged and took us into her, to her barrack. So we were in the children's barrack, a little more safe. But I was selected out of there too eventually <laughs> because I was, I didn't eat. So I was just getting thinner and thinner, but I was healthy. Survived, I would have survived just, they were killing people. And uh, we did nothing there. This was the Seelager, the famous Seelager in Birkenau. We arrived to Auschwitz but a few days Later, they put us in there, and there we remained. And then we did nothing, sat in the sun, which was very hard to take, on the ground, naturally, alongside the barrack, as much shade as we could get out of those walls, and doing nothing. And then they started taking transports to work, but we knew that we had no chance of getting selected to work because we were young. And they needed strong people. That's what they said. Uh, we never knew what they do with the people and where they went. We had with us a, how was that? A second cousin. She was a very good looking girl. An aunt had taken her to Berlin. She was educated and did not get married. She must have been, I think, 28 or 30 years old. In those years, that was old. My mother already had grown children by then. And she sort of, she was very close with the family. Family always stayed close. Friday night after dinner, everybody would come for, to the house for cake and tea. And they would spend like half a night just the men learning and the women chatting, singing and so on. And there was no TV and all those radios were taken away and such. And she sort of felt an obligation we were the children. So she didn't want to go to work. She tried to avoid it that she shouldn't be taken to work. She was very beautiful, good-looking girl, intelligent, sophisticated appearance. And she said, because of you kids, I am going to die here because you don't eat and you're getting thinner, every, <laughs> bigger every day, and I am going to go to work. She announced it to us. We were sleeping one next to another in the cots. 
And uh, my sister said to her, if you think you could go, you go, because here you're not safe, that's sure. Next to us was a lager. It was called the Zigzainer, the gypsy lager. And they were there with children and mothers and grandmothers and husbands together. And they somehow, I don't know where they got it from, they would even cook outside. They would make a little fire and have a potato and bake it or a corn. How they got it, I don't know, but they had. It used to be smoke and they would smoke that, that food smell, you know, because we were just separated with wire uh, fences. And uh, we called her Zali Nini and so on and so. And uh, she announced to us, I'm not going to stay with you kids here. You're not eating. I don't think you have a chance of getting out of here. The first chance I have, I'm going to work. A few days later, they announced that they're going to... No, no, it wasn't announced. There is a rumor that they're going to take pretty women to special work, just those that are good-looking. And sure enough, Zalinini, the way we called her, announced to us that if she gets selected, she's going. And she was selected out and was going. Following morning, we get up in the morning, she's in the lager next to us. The gypsies are not there anymore. They took them out during the night. They put in these good-looking people that they selected out. And we were very happy, hoping that she'll remain there. The third day, the lager was empty. They said they cremated all the pretty women that night. They didn't have what to do with them. Took them straight to the crematorium. Zali Nani wasn't anymore. But we remained. We were in the children block doing nothing. Seven months in Birkenau. Doing nothing. Sitting in the sun during the day. Being counted twice a day by Mangala. Selected. I don't know how, but we remained. It was just meant to be, it's accidental, nothing else. And then we heard that Birkenau is closing up. It was actually the months were going, it must have been October by then. We came there in May, October or November, that they're liquidating, closing up. Now. And we were wondering what will they do with us, but we didn't know. And they called it, it will be a general selection. Oh, before that, they took me out one day again. I was selected out because I was very fragile, very thin and little. My little sister was strong, she was good. She was exactly a year younger than me, exactly. My mother used to dress up alike, like twins, because we used to be very jealous of each other. Even if a sock had a different design than the other, she had to return it, send it back, and get one that is the same. We were very close, but also very jealous on each other. She was a smart little girl, and... Uh, they selected me out. They took us to a barracks. I'll never forget that number, 34. And there we were, waiting that they're going to take us out. During the night, I didn't even know. I thought that my sister came to tell me something through the walls. Mimi, I'll come there in the morning when they go for the coffee. And remember, be pre-prepared, come closer to the door. I'll beat up the woman that's at the door. That's how she was, <laughs> she was always beating up everybody. And if she doesn't let me, I'll kill her. I'll go and I'll take you out of there. I thought that she said that to me through a door because I was dazed and frightened. 
and I didn't know what was going on. She came in. I, she tells me today, how can you not remember that I was in there for you? She came and took me out and told me to run. And wherever I can go in to a barrack, I should go in. There was a thousand people in the barrack, so the chances would be that they wouldn't find me. And that's how I remained alive. The day after, when they came to take out all those that they selected, it was called general selection, and the rumor on the grounds was that they're going to close up Birkenau. And we were wondering what will happen. So they, in the evening, they took us out to a camp across the way. We were in the sea lager, sea lager. And uh, we were waiting to see what will happen. They took us, that was a terrible place. It had no water and it had no toilets. In the morning, they took us to the railroad station. They gave us new dresses, clean dresses, and they put us into wagons. And they said, you'll get breakfast soon. The breakfast never came, nor did lunch, nor did water nor did anything. They kept us it was very hot. And they kept us till the evening. Then they took us out of the wagons. They undressed us and back to this terrible lager. And we were told that tomorrow there will be general selection. We didn't know what to expect. They lined us up, say lapel, mangala there naturally. And my little sister was taking away just two people before. And so as they took her, but there's nothing to do. Uh, my sister begged her to hide. Oh, what I didn't tell you is, in this terrible lager, we were, I think, about three weeks, there was a old German soldier. He was a Wehrmacht. And there were lots of barracks behind us. And those barracks held the stuff that the people brought in, blankets and whatever, clothing and whatever they had. And uh, this person approached my little sister. She was young. She was 13 years old said to her, listen, little girl, you have no chance of getting out from here. Come here in the morning. They would take us out at 3 and Angel it came when about 8, 9, 10 o'clock, whenever. Come here in the morning, and I'll hide you in these barracks for the day, and then you'll go back at night. This lasted three weeks. She would go there. He would hide her under blankets and tell her when to come out. She said, but I know I will not survive because this cannot go on like that. Meantime, uh, being on these gro grounds was terrible. It was very hot and it wasn't finished. We had usually finished roads that it wasn't finished. It was just ground uh, that was messy with stones and all kinds of things laying around. And there was somehow a river that dried up in that uh, compound. And it was Friday, and I wanted to wash up for Shabbos. Not that we washed every day, because it was too dangerous. And I saw a little water in the bottom of that ditch. I think it was a river that had dried. And I had a, my soup bowl, and I went and I took a little water, and we would tear off a piece of the dress and wash up. And I undressed on the grounds where I thought nobody sees me. I mean, there were 30,000 people. There was no such a thing. But to me, it was satisfactory to go and wash with a little water in the bowl. An SS woman was on the roof, someplace, on the roof someplace, 
and saw me, and she came down and she beat me up with her, what do you call it, a uh, leather strap she had. It has a name, but I can't think of it. I know it in Hungarian, but I don't know what What is that in one of these leather sticks? But I had marks all over my body for months. In fact, I had a problem. They found on my splint five dots years ago here under under. Uh, checkups. I had a problem with had the gallbladder removed, and somehow some stones remained in the bile duct. And I was running fever for many days. This is here already. And the doctor saw those dots and tried to figure out what is that. Uh, to different hospitals. I was between Lenox Hill and Sinai. They couldn't understand how could there be two, three, uh, five little rounds, one next to another, on the splint. They, at first they thought maybe it's cancer, but they realized it's not cancer, and they didn't know what it was. And the decision was, I had told them that I was beaten up with a rubber strap. I don't know whether she had a metal something at the edge, or just a knot, and they thought that it could be that I had I, a sore there, and that it dried up and it left these little five dots. But I still don't know. That was all right. It wasn't cancer, and that was good. I don't have a tissue. Anyway, and. and this is Weingarten. You're going to stop for a moment. Very good. I'll and get the tissue. We're okay? going to stop for a moment. We'll pick up later. Thank you. We'll begin again, Mrs. Weingarten. Uh, so your last discussion was... Um, they in general election, and we didn't know what was happening with this Bay option in Iran. Did I tell you about the transport they took us on, and then they undressed us again? No. Continue with that. No, I don't think so. Oh. So my little sister was taken out in front of me, and that was very hard to take. I was very close with her. My mother used to call us the shoeless children. Actually, it's exactly the time it was shoeless, and I was heartbroken, terribly broken. With her, uh, we would always, the two, my sister was four years older, she sort of, uh, was sort of distant. Uh, with her we would celebrate Friday night. We would save our bread that day from the morning to the evening. And then if we would find a piece of paper or a piece of our dresses, because dresses were too long anyway, we would tear it off and go behind the barrack and make ourselves Shabbat. And one time, my little sister said to me, Mimi, you know what they say? You see the fire there, the flames? We were very close to Auschwitz, three kilometers. I think that's what I heard. And this is where they burned our parents. I said, no, God wouldn't let that happen. It can't be. It can't be that they killed us. I was such a strong believer that I really thought God was shielding us. And uh, after the war, after a lot of thinking, I was wondering, where is there a God? And my husband was a yeshiva booker. He studied in a uh, modern yeshiva, and he was a Slovak. He was between uh, Bratislava and uh, where was he, Shuran. And he was from, 
He really believed. He was a strong believer. And I would say to him, how can you believe if all these things happen in our time? And he would say to me, do you know a better way? Uh, it changed me a lot. And I live with that. Life goes on. God was good to me. And I still say that, despite of the I grew up like that, raised the children, as she would. And well, I feel that belief is a good thing. And I don't know what I believe in. But when I see those hope and believe, I feel there's nothing. <laughs> Where did I leave it off? The day of Schneidrai. You were you were um, taken on on a transport. We were yeah we were dressed up. They were supposed to take us to work. They kept us a whole day, no water, no food, no toilet. And they said, "You're getting you're getting it later. You're getting it. the doors are locked. You're getting food later." Food never came. It was six o'clock. They took us out of the train. They left us with the dresses, took us back to Bay of Schneidrai. I think that they gave a meal there, but I don't remember. And we were there for weeks more doing nothing, just sitting around. Then one day we heard they're going to, it was already, I don't know whether October or November, that they'll be taking us to work. It was already many months in Birkenau. They were closing up that camp. But we also heard, we had among us a group of Russians and they had some radios. They, they had news of what's going on outside, but we didn't get much of it. But we, they did let us know that the war is ending, it's nearing. The Russians are approaching. But they took us to work into an aeroplane factory. Uh, naturally, they walked us there. I don't know, I don't remember how long. And this was already a better place. We were placed into a transport cologne. Only my sister and I, the third sister wasn't there anymore. And they had their metal sheets, I would say six by six foot large, heavy, and we were supposed to take that just one block from one building to the next in this aeroplane factory. Uh, we were supposed to hold it by the edge on our shoulder and pull it. Well, I was very weak by then. I looked like a ch child of seven, not 15. I was almost 16. Oh, no, I was, no, I wasn't yet. And I fell under the natural metal sheet. I couldn't carry that. And the women came quickly, picked it up, and they would go a few steps with the sheet for me, then come back, go and take their sheet to where we were going. And then they took my sheet. I couldn't carry it. I just stood near it. And when we got in front of the next building, it was large windows, I remember, and there was standing a woman in, in civilian clothes and the SS woman in her uniform. And they were looking at me, how I cannot carry it, actually. And 
I thought, well, this is it. If you couldn't work, then you went back to Auschwitz. Uh, the woman in the civilian clothes approached me and she said, don't worry, you'll have it good here. And I said to myself, how will I have it good? I can't do that work. I was scared that they'll send me back. And even if she said that you'll have it good, I never knew what that meant. And the following morning, when we came in, and actually at 3 o'clock they started walking toward the work. And we arrived there, by then it was light, it was 6 o'clock, I don't know how far it was. And she called me, and I said to myself, this is it. If they call you back, that means you're not capable. And she takes me in and she said to me like this, listen, little girl, if you'll be nice and you'll do what I tell you, you'll have a good job. I didn't know what to make of it. She said, you'll come in, you'll rest up, and then I'll tell you what to do. She took me in, she put together three empty boxes behind shelves, and she said, go to sleep. It wasn't reality to me. I think she even gave me something to eat, because I only, I never ate, I still didn't eat. And then I got up. She said, so are you ready for work? I said, yes, I'm ready. She said, listen, I have a friend in the next building. It's about a block away from here. I write a letter. You take it to her and wait until she writes me back. You deliver that letter to her. She gave me a letter the following morning. I walked to that building. I inquired where she is. I found her a beautiful looking Russian girl with beautiful long black hair. And she welcomed me and she said, sit down here, Ventine wrote a letter, gave it to me, carry it back. Nobody, don't show it to anybody, give it only to her. And I did that. So I became a mail carrier for her. I had it very good. I would come in, she would put me to sleep. I think she always had something to give me to eat. So it was paradise. And in this factory, eventually, I was put to work. And that was good, too. Uh, it was aeroplanes, half of the plane body. And I had to go up on a ladder, go into that body, to that half plane. And there was a man, a monster, he was called. Nassets standing near it, and he told me what I'll do. Gave me a large drilling machine, this large, and I was even afraid of the sound of it. And he taught me how to make little holes where they attach the upper part of the plane. In other words, the windows were in that row, and these hooks connected the two parts, but I only had the bottom, and I made little holes, I would say a half inch large, and all around in that plane. And I would count, it was hundreds. Uh, they were close to one another. And the, then when the SS would walk away, and the Meister was away, I started counting the holes that I made. I'll be, will I survive? Will I not survive? Will I survive? Will I not? If it came out not, I started again. Ah, I counted wrong. <laughs> and this kept me with hope. I will survive because it came out good. And that was going for months. Uh, 
was good because the work wasn't hard. And uh, I don't remember the food, but I think there was something already that was edible. I don't even remember. And we were there a few months. This was uh, October or November. And it was May 5th. May must have been the beginning of May when they started marching us. We didn't know what's happening. I heard the Russians let us know. We weren't with them. Everybody was in separate areas, these factories, and the factories. Uh, the ladder carrying stopped, and I was working doing these halls, and I heard that the war is ending. I didn't know what that means, naturally, but we were hopeful. And uh, one day, they marched us out, not to come back and not to the factory. We marched, I think, for two days, and that was terrible. No food, no water. I had a pair of wooden sole shoes with cloth. And after walking for a while, came up with blisters. And then the blisters were busting. And I was like in a bowl of water. And that hurt terribly. And I said to the people who I was standing at, we were on lines of five. If you couldn't keep up, they shoot you. Yeah, no way out. They just, people remained a lot, most of the group stopped. They just couldn't go. My people carried me. They pulled me. I couldn't walk anymore. My feet were hurting so that I couldn't, it was impossible to walk. And they pulled me until I think it was the second warning. They told us, we'll go to a restaurant in a building, you'll get food. It was supposed to be a restaurant in the outskirts of a town. And they brought us to a building. It was night when we arrived. I collapsed. I just fell asleep. But I didn't collapse. I fell asleep. That's all I remember. There was a banister, and I stopped near that banister. I wanted to sit down on a step, but it was taken before I was able to sit down. And I just fell asleep, fell down on the ground, and I fell asleep. And in the morning, I heard, get out, get out, we are free, we are free. This was in Bart, northern Germany, northeast Germany. I don't know. The town from where we left was Bart. I didn't know where we were, and I didn't believe it, that we are liberated. And people said, we are here alone, no more SS. And then we saw them running on the road. This restaurant was at the edge of a town, and there was, a, I think, a highway or a smaller road. I, I don't know what. All I know is that I remained sleeping, and I woke up, and they said, they said the Russians are here, the Russians are here. Oh, they started yelling. That's how I woke up. The Russians are here. And what they, did that mean to us? They, we still didn't get food. We, they took us out of that building, chased us out. It was like small woods. And we entered those woods, and I fell asleep on the ground. That's all I knew. And then, oh, there's food, there's food. A tank came, and I think they had bread. And they gave out bread. I don't know whether I got a piece of bread or not, because they didn't have much. But they said that the Germans ran away. They're on the roads. Uh, some of them undressed, changed clothes, and came to stay among us. But 
I don't remember anybody. I was finished. I fell asleep and I just slept. And then trucks came and they did bring food later in the day. And they put us on trucks and took us into Germany to there were liberated uh, war veterans, Americans. And they put us into barracks and they told us to be careful because the Russians are wild. They were people that were six, seven years in the army, in their young, and they are wild. And the Americans are war veterans. You better stay just where you are. That's where you'll be safe. And they gave us food. We settled into those barracks. And from there it started the after war troughs. It was, we were liberated, but we weren't really free because we dealt with people that were wild. The Russian army, the soldiers wanted only women. That's what they wanted. So somehow two older officers took us. Under them, we were safe. Uh, they told us not to talk to anyone not to accept anything and not to go with them. This was the new Brandenburg. I still don't know where it is. There we were already free. These American officers arranged functions, dancing, food and dancing, and everybody went. My sister and I, I mean not everybody, but most people then, young girls, they had a ball, but we were afraid to go. We always stayed where they told us to stay. And from there we started thinking. Uh, people told us from other camps that they saw my father, he's alive. And when I heard that, I said to my sister, let's go home, but nothing moved. There was no railroad, uh, no means of transportation. People still traveled with wagons in Germany or on uh, horseback or um, what did they call them, little uh, carriages that took people from city to city. There was not, nothing moving really as far as railroads. They would go from one town to the other and stop. They didn't have probably coal or oil or whatever they needed. But I wanted to go home. It took us a few weeks. We got home. My father wasn't home, didn't find him. Then we started going from city to large cities to hospitals to look for father. They said he was sick, but nobody knew where he is. They saw him, they acknowledged each other that they were alive, and they parted. And I, we never found out where he actually was, and he died. We went, came all the way to Budapest that had a large Jewish hospital. He wasn't there. and. Uh, it was interesting. We went from bed to bed. A lady recognized me. She said, little girl, come here. Uh, an old woman. And uh, she said, I am your relative. I said, my relative? I said, yes, I'm from there in that city. And I am your mother's aunt. She said, you look like your mother. I could tell that who you are. But we continued on looking, never found my father. I don't know where he died. Went all the way home, house was occupied by Jews, business was reopened, occupied. They didn't even let us in. They were a large family. 
and they didn't have where to put us to sleep for even one night. So we wandered in the city, and we finally ended up at the joint. I just got this week. Oh my God, I didn't see that word joint since then. I said to myself, that's an organization I should support. They took us in. There was a children's home there pre-war, and they bought daily products from us. And some older people recognized us, who we are. So, well, they had anyway, whoever came back for a few days, you could stop there. And I just wanted to go back, find my father. I will find him. Uh, and this is life after liberation. We were still sad for a long time. We got onto railroads, and we were penniless. Oh, in the city, uh, we went to my father's a friend, businessman. He had wholesale and retail of everything, and. He said, oh, your children have here a fortune. What fortune do we have? He took us to a stock room and showed us the large boxes from ceiling to floor. My father ordered milk separated by electric. electric. We still had machines that were turned by hand. But that had to be ordered from Germany, I remember the brand even, Aqua, and it was ordered, I was a child in 38, you had to pay them, the money went to Switzerland, and it was promised to be delivered in 1944, you know, they were good at that, they were delivered in 1944 when we were deported, but he left this friend that if that arrives, please, they're paid for, accept them. And he did, and he said, take them. <laughs> Do you need that? It was very sad, we were penniless, but we didn't even have the brains to ask for a few dollars or something. It didn't even occur to us, did I need money? I wanted my father, <laughs> not the money. And they remained there. Eventually, in a few days, my sister had a boyfriend and she, who she was corresponding with. He was from across the border from Czechoslovakia, a very distant, how is it, a distant relative of my mother's son. And he came to the city already in very bad times. To the doctors, they allowed. We all, we had passports. In fact, I have pictures of my parents, and that's because we found the passports, uh, and we cleaned them out. And I have eight by tens in my bedroom. And uh, my sister, oh, he left letters all over. He was corresponding until it was doable with this cousin. He was very handsome and she liked him, and they corresponded. They didn't know each other, just since he came in for the tonsillitis, there was a sanatorium in my city, and he bled away. <laughs> they didn't have, you know, the kind of equipment that there is today. Uh, we never knew what happened, but he was bleeding, so he couldn't send him back. So he remained in this city for months. And she befriended him. And during the war, they corresponded until it was doable. And then they lost contact. But when he came back from forced labor, every city he came to, to and he knew that Jews are congregating returnees. He left a few lines that if such and such comes, give her if she needs some money or whatever, or if you could, could stop them, give them lodging. 
I'll take care of it when I come back. And we found a few such letters, so she wanted to go back over the normal world to Czechoslovakia, and I didn't want to go. I cried out to my father to come. But he never came back. We don't know where he died. And uh, I wouldn't go. We were at the joint. Uh, they let us stay a little longer than others because they saw I didn't want to go. So my sister found two people in the city, acquaintance, and one was a neighbor, or a relative, actually, a distant relative. And they sat down with me. She's an older sister. She wants to go, you go. I didn't want to go, no way. But I had no choice because we couldn't stay at the joint either. People constantly came. They had to make room for the incoming people. And we started going back toward the west. He had settled in uh, Czechoslovakia, near Prague. And he was waiting her, so she got married in 1945. I took her to go. It was very sad. I didn't want her to get married. I begged her, don't. If your father would be here, you would run because the boy is running you. But she wanted to go, and she married him. And they're still here. My brother was 96, just stopped driving. And she is 91 or 2. Married uh, many, many years. And that was the begin beginning of our lives. She got married, and naturally, uh, a uncle was looking for him, an uncle in America. So when they sat down for papers, I said, don't write about me, I'm not going to America. <laughs> We never had anyone here or in Israel. Nobody ever moved. They were very happy where they were. And uh, I said, I'm going with the Bricha to Palestine. This is 1945. She married. I registered with the Bricha, but I ended up in America. It was just meant to be. How did that happen? My brother-in-law had an uncle whom he didn't know. Uh, his father, the brother of this uncle, died before he was born. I don't know what happened. I think, I think he was sick. I don't know. <laughs> Excuse me. And uh, she settled in Sudetenland. Uh, and I said, don't write about me. I'm not going to America. I want to go to Palestine <laughs> with the bricha. It was the illegal bricha. And I registered with Shomrim. Mm -hmm. And I had a little friend. She had her family. They were religious people. And that her father heard that I registered to go with the bricha with Shomrim. You don't know who you are, you don't know what you are, you don't know what you're doing <laughs> and where you're going. And he rode away to a rabbi in Czechoslovakia, Kasho. He put me into a girl's, to a youth home, a girl's home. And uh, that's where I ended up after the war, after my sister married. And. Uh, and time passes, and things fall into place. She cried, and I, why do I go? What if things will be bad, or never we meet, who knows? <laughs> it was such a wobbly, insecure time and existence, especially for me. I was young, 16 years old. Did I know what I want? I just know there is Palestine. Oh, we had two Russian fathers that we picked up at liberation. They were two Jews. One was Jewish-minded, 
And he said, you go to Palestine. And the other one said, no, come home to Mother Russia. Uh, they were good people. They saved us from the wild army. They were with us. They kept an eye on us, and they helped with whatever they could. How we lived, I don't know. You know, homeless. That was the truth. We would shower under railroads under, I don't know whether they still existed in oh, well in France, you saw them. The large pumps on the railroads, that's where we would shower. In the, in the one dress that we had, so the dress got washed too. Unbelievable. You know, today if I think back, that far? Yeah, I myself, no wonder that the world denies it. Could that have been reality? The trip that I just took with you, I really was there on that cobblestone walk. And uh, it never left me, really. It's always with me. I mean, that experience, the way I lost the family, the way things happened at that time, it's just didn't go away. Pictures are very clear forever. And Hitler said that. That those, did you read my Kampf? I'm sure you did. Mm -hmm. You know what he said, even those that were remain will not have normal lives. And it's true. It remains with us forever. Just can go around crying or telling the world what it was. And today I say to myself, no wonder the world denies it. it it's, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Mrs. And that's all you get. Just... Mrs. Weingarten, um, we're going to look at some of the family pictures right now. So yeah, we're going to stop us. this for a moment and then we'll recommence. Thank you. So we will continue now with uh, looking at some of these photos of your of your family in Seget. So, this of, if you want to continue, um, Mrs. Weingarten. About my father. Yeah, my father was a small merchant in Seget. Uh, we made daily products. We weren't farmers. The milk was delivered from the country. Uh, brought in early morning, and we would have separators that separated the milk into different parts. Some of it was made into sour cream, butter, cheese, and then the remnants, hard cheeses. It was a struggle. The machine was turned by hand. It was hard tiring. If the people that worked steady couldn't do it, they would employ some people from the street, which we called the Traegers. They were there to help people to carry stuff and such and make a few dollars. And my mother used to say that you children don't know what life is all about. This decent man turns that machine for two hours for the price of a bread. She felt bad, but probably they couldn't pay more. Life was hard. We children didn't feel it. Went to school, went to Vesyakov after school, until it existed. Uh, Your father was a religious man? Yes, but not Hasidish. My grandfather was a Hasid that wore on Shabbat a businessman. He was an importer of herring, uh, made a good living. They had a beautiful home. Life was beautiful. He wore a kaftan shawl on Shabbat. Can you explain uh, a Shabbat with your father at the head of the table? Yes. Well, my. Everybody would go to shul on Shabbat, the men especially, the women also. 
In fact, my mother always had a seat, the second row in the Kohanish and the Sematrish. The Kohanim had a separate, they did not mix with the rest of the city, separate, more sure. On the property that was belonged to the Kohanim, we also had a house there, we lived there. And uh, my grandfather went to a close. I don't know whether you heard about that. Yeah. He was a chassid, Kachman Shtramon on Shabbat. And uh, but sp spoke Hungarian and Yiddish. Yiddish was naturally the language that we spoke at home with my mother, Hungarian. Uh, they had secular education. In fact, I have here a letter with my father's handwriting that we cherished how beautiful he wrote. Uh, this is all we have left, so that's what we hold on to. I was beautiful because the family was close and warm. My grandfather would get up at six or seven in the morning. He was already in our house. He lived about a block away with cake that grandmother baked. My mother baked, but grandmother was better. He would have it wrapped in his pockets. The custom had large pockets, I remember. That. And he looked forward to grandpa coming. Uh, the warmth of the family in itself is something that I cherish. I don't think it exists anymore. And that's my mother. She was a kind and friendly woman, loved people. Our house, house was an open house to everybody. Uh, everybody was an important relative, whoever would show up from across the border. We had a small house, but everybody had room. There was no such thing that we don't have room for someone if they came. And then there were people from out of town that learned trades in the city. They would eat in our house. We didn't have room for lodging, but everybody was welcome. There was no such thing that I don't have room. She had help. Life was hard. It wasn't what it is today here. Uh, we did not have any running water in the house yet, and uh, but we had a servant and also a boy that my mother took in, who had parents that were drunkards, and he would hang out near the business since it was food for a long time. When he was little, she used to just feed him. Eventually, she took him in, sent him to school, and then he helped out in the. House. He remained with us. He was a very nice boy. He was very decent in the ghetto times. Uh, he came around whether they need anything. And my mother would complain, father doesn't drink the milk because he doesn't know where it comes from. So he came one day with a glass large dish. He would go to where they had cows, milk the cows. I was there, Daddy. I watched it. This is kosher. It's clean. I watched it. She never was alone <laughs> with the milk. You could have it. That's how from they were. It was important to them. This is my sister. Apparently, he was a traveling salesman. Then he married my mother. For a while he still traveled. And then my grandfather, who was comfortable, put his foot down. I will not have a traveling salesman. I don't know whether there, you know the word Satneshke past. You can't do that. I don't want you to travel. So once I was born, I'm four years younger than my sister. It was the end of his travels. 
and he brought us that doll, and with this doll, the four of us played for many years. It was a very beautiful doll that we cherished. This is the sister that survived with you. That what? This is the sister that survived. Right, this is the sister that I have, thank God. This was the base Yaakov in Sigurd. We had a wonderful teacher, many classes together. This is my sister. He used to show, Elie Wiesel used to show this picture for many years. Uh, we all went to base Yaakov. I only had, I think, two years. So this is her class, I'm not here. This writing, the that letter, uh, was my father's handwriting. We cherish it. I thought it was beautiful, and it's beautifully written on Hung in Hungarian. He had Hungarian schools. My parents both had secular education, Hungarian schools. Uh, when my mother and father were born, this was Austro-Hungary for many, many years. Uh, life was good at that time when we were reoccupied. I don't exactly know the year. She always said, this is not the Hungarians I hoped for, <laughs> because life was very different under occupation of Hungary. Could you tell us uh, the people in this picture, please? In the picture, that's my grandma. This her, is my... Her name? Her name, her name was Rachel Kahan. And this is my oldest sister, with my youngest sister. I don't know how old she was when we were deported. She's four years older than I am. That's my sister in that past. And this is my younger two sister who was with us for seven months until general election of Birkenau, when Birkenau closed up. Uh, she was taken away last minute. And at the end, here? Oh, this is me already, That's after the war, 1946. This was the number we were registered with when we arrived to Birkenau. And that was on our dress for a while. Uh, I saved it to show to my parents. I was hoping that they will return. And I keep it. It was an important place where I wore that number. Uh, I don't know how long we wore it, whether all the way or not. I don't even remember. So it was the number was on one dress? Uh, we only had one dress, and that was the nightgown and the dress and our toilet paper and every purpose that we needed, a piece of cloth that was torn off the dress, and we had what we had. It was very sad. And if we wanted to make shoppers, we would tear off my little sister and I behind the barrack, we would tear off a piece of cloth and put our bread on that cloth, and we made Shabbos. Very sad times. This is my sister, who married immediately after the war. My Ranola was waiting for her in Sudetenland. That was near the Oss Sea, came back. That's where they settled. They got married in 45. I took her under the chuppah with a ex-brother-in-law. And thank God they are here. They're old and happy ever after.
They have three daughters that are married, and life was all right. This is my husband and me when we arrived to America. I met him at the wedding. We married nine years later. I wasn't ready to get married. I came here and I saw how my friends struggled with little children. Why was misery? I didn't want to get married. I had a job, worked, and waited for better days to come. That in itself was a story. And that's my, oh, my husband's. This is, this is the house we had. I was told that it was used for, first it was, we had an extra door, my parents' bedroom. Uh, that, this was taken over by offices in the beginning. And as the time was passing, once they took us out, we were told that it was army people that lived in it. Eventually, it was a, uh, now I can't think of it, for animals, a stable. stable. And it was run down terribly. When we came back to Sikit, we stopped in the center of the yard. The woman came out that lived in it, and she asked us who we were. And I was with my sister, with my brother and my husband. And we said, we were the people that lived here. She said, it couldn't be because they had young children. I said, is that so? And the young children already got old. We were there about uh, 20 years later. And she said, I knew that family. I said, you did? How did you know them? She said, I was a servant down the street at the Katz family. And I used to come to their dairy store to shop for my people. And I said, yes, the children are already grown ups. And she couldn't believe it that we lived there. And she didn't invite us. A little child was outside. She went telling her mother that there are strangers in the yard. And she didn't even ask her in. But once I told her that the children are grown up, so she said, do you want to come in? I said, no. We did not go in. It was terribly dilapidated. As you see, no stairs or nothing. But it's many years later, this was the entrance. During the war, my father in the yard were homes, and we had a gentile janitor that would entertain, let people in, boys and girls. She had a one-room apartment, and my father would escort us through the entrance we shouldn't go alone, <laughs> didn't trust her. I, he said, it's dangerous. And this was a business location. I don't exactly know which one, because they are read down whether this or that, I don't know. And these were the Khan family. The yard was called the Kahanhof. It was a wealthy family of my parents that we were related to. I don't know whether my father bought that or, or inherited, but that's where we lived since I was born until we were taken away. They were our business also. Mrs. Weingarten, um, is there something you'd like to say before we conclude uh, this interview? Is there something you would like to say before we conclude the interview? What should I tell you? It was a tragic time in history. That's how I see it today. 
when I lived it, it was unbearable. I am not surprised that the world denies it because it's an unheard of story and it was a very tragic time. It doesn't seem real to me even today that this could have happened. Uh, how I remained alive, I don't know, and why I don't know either. There were so many brilliant, knowledgeable, great people that were killed, and I'm here. God was very good to me. I still say God, because I don't know a better way. But it's sad. How I remained alive, I can't explain to myself and why. But good things happened to me. I have children, two daughters, they're doctors. Nice son-in-laws, wonderful grandchildren. I mean, to me, they're great. And I'm grateful for that and thankful that we could accomplish after that terrible tragedy. And I many times wonder how come that I remained alive. I was weak, young, lonely, sad, and I'm here in pretty good health considering my age. So I'm grateful for that, but sad forever. We carry that in our heart all the time. There isn't a day go by where it doesn't come to my mind on Sunday, because it was a very sad experience. Thank you very much, Mrs. Weinberg. I thank